This episode is brought to you by BigMooseCoffeeCompany.co. Pals, pals, greetings, greetings, greetings and welcome to another episode of Everything Endurance. Thanks for joining us again. Hope you enjoyed the last week. Um, Hope you enjoyed the last episode too. Honestly, if you didn't come off the back of the last episode wishing that Steve Hill MBA was your primary school teacher, that you were back at eight years old now with him filling your head with inspiration and ideas for adventures, then I don't know what's up with you, but what what an absolutely inspirational bloke. A um, lot of inspirational stuff going on at the moment though, isn't there? More more records getting knocked off left, right and centre. I guess since last time we spoke, um, Dan Lawson, obviously, he's just done the entire length of Great Britain. He's... Um, 870 odd miles he managed to get that record down below 10 days which is just absolutely astonishing i dan must have been I, arguably the only runner in the uk at the moment with it in his legs to have done what he's just done and i uh, couldn't have gone to a more deserving guy um have a look at what dan lawson gets up to have a look at rerun clothing and the fantastic work he's doing there and yes of course i am working to get dan onto the show we'll have a good chat to him about his incredible record um what else john kelly John Kelly, at the time of recording this little intro to the podcast, which is the uh, afternoon of Friday, the 21st of August, John Kelly is towards the end of his grand round, um, the second part of his Hartley Slam. Um, If those words don't mean anything to you, then go back to the most recent episode we did with John Kelly, where he talks all about his briefly held Pennine YFKT record, which was the first half of his Hartley Slam. He has just run the Paddy Buckley round in under 24 hours, cycled up to the Lake District, run the Bob Graham in under 24 hours, cycled all the way up, way up north into Scotland, and he's just a few summits away from the end of the the Ramsey round at the moment, which is just staggering. It's his second attempt at this record. Uh, Last time around, he didn't finish the cycle up into Scotland, so he is way, way ahead of where he stopped last time, and by all accounts, looking very strong. So um, by the time you're listening to this, John, um, check your inbox. You'll have an email from me, okay? Um, Our guest today, let's, let's get into that. Our guest today is somebody else who has just set a record for running the entire length of Great Britain. Um, This is the third time we've interviewed an athlete who has just broken the women's record for the joggle or the jog. Either way, take your pick. Land's End to John O'Groats or John O'Groats to Land's End. Um, she knocked off the 874 mile. And uh, if you're a metric type of a person, that's about 1,400 kilometers. Um, she knocked off that 1,400 kilometers of running in 12 hours and 30 minutes, which is pretty astonishing. Um, this is a runner who has run for Team GB in the 100 kilometer distance events, um, but also born in South Africa. She's a member of an elite running group down there as well. Um, somebody who at the beginning of lockdown was under a strict South African lockdown and only able to train for this ridiculous record by running up and down a 100 meter driveway shared with a few other neighbors outside her house. Um, so expect bags of determination from this guest. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the magnificent Carla Molinaro. Carla, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I, I, no problem at all. Um, it's a pleasure to have you along. And after what you've just done, it, it would have been remiss of me not to seek you out and try and get you on the show. So no, no, no thanks necessary. Um it's taken a little while to uh, tie this interview together, so you've had plenty of recovery time since the uh, since the world record. How are you feeling now? Yeah, I'm feeling all right. For the first couple of weeks afterwards, I felt like I had jet lag, um, which was a bit strange. But yeah, it's quite nice. I'm feeling like a normal human again. <laughs> and yeah, I guess you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you for even more detail because there aren't many of us out there either producing like me or listening to this podcast who can relate to what it feels like to have just run the entire length of Britain. So for that first couple of weeks, what what was your body actually going through? Yeah, so I guess immediately finishing, my body all kind of swelled up. Um, I think from 
just sitting and doing nothing where it had been moving the whole time. It was a bit, I guess it was like almost in shock. It was like, what have you done to me? And I ended up with like my quads going down to my feet, all being the same width, which was delightful. Yeah. Um, And then, yeah, I was just really tired. Um, Almost like in this like weird, like I said, like jet laggy kind of feeling. Um, And I guess that was just from having 12 days of sleep deprivation pretty much <laughs> and then yeah everything everything hurt um and but slowly over like the two weeks it's now been three weeks everything every day it's kind of got a little bit easier I'm feeling better like I actually feel fine now I did my first bike ride yesterday which was exciting getting nice. out for an hour and yeah everything appears to be working properly so <laughs> yeah well that's very good to hear just nice yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic um yeah sorry to dig into that it just occurred to me then that i have no idea what it could possibly feel like so have just run all of that distance um but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves it's the first time we've had you on the show and um before we get into the record attempt i'd like to get a bit more into how you got to this point so Carla Molinaro, what what was your journey into these big running adventures that we're seeing you do now? Where did it begin? I guess I've I've always done sport in some way, shape or form. Um, but I started running when I was at school when I was about 15, 16. Um, started off with your usual 800, 1500 meters cross country around the school fields. Um, I then went to university where I took up triathlon. I actually did triathlon for 10 years, but then after about 10 years, I just went and did this one race. It was actually Glasgow half marathon. And I just loved that all I had to do was run. (laughs) And I guess that's when I like really like almost fell in love with running. I was like, it's actually so simple. I don't have to worry about a wetsuit and a helmet and a bike and where my shoes are and how to jump on a bike and how to jump off it. And for me, I just liked the simplicity of just going to a start line and chucking running shoes on. And then about a year after that, I decided to just book a trip um, to the Swiss Alps um, and go and run in the mountains. I'd like never been in the mountains before. I had no idea what running in the mountains would be like, but it seemed like a bit of an adventure. And I think that's where the start of like adventure running came for me, where I took myself away on a holiday. I did different runs and walks and hikes in the mountain each day and finished it off actually with a race. And from there, yeah, I've kind of just done slightly longer, slightly different, like fast packing running adventures. And yeah, this year it kind of spiraled out of control where I decided to run up the country. (laughs) Spiraled out of control. Like it wasn't your fault this happened. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um it also it, as is the case with a lot of the guests on here there's there's quite a lot of humility in there your your racing cv is is strong anyone who dips into your website can see that you you seem to have a particularly sort of enduring relationship with the comrades mm. yeah, yeah so i've done comrades four times now um i was born in south africa and i think my dad said to me once you're not a real runner until you've done comrades because that's what all south africans think so i was like (laughs) well obviously i have to do it now (laughs) and yeah for anyone that likes ultra running um you must put comrades on your bucket list because it's just an insanely awesome race uh, it's been high on my list for a good few years now, I think ever since I first found out about it. But uh, how many times have you been up and up and down that course now? So I've done it four times, two times up, two times down. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. So that's a little bit about, you know, how you came to get to this point in the first place. But And everyone, I think, dreads this kind of a question, but what's the why? What's the why you would put yourself in the way of the amount of suffering that we're about to talk about? Um, well, I do really like to eat cake. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Carbs are a great reason for doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, and I love food. And, you know, if I don't exercise, um, I become like a little oompa loompa. So um, that's one driver. And also 
I just love like the adventure. Like there's so many cool things that you can see on your own two feet. And by doing these running like races and adventures, like you get to see everything slowly where, which I really enjoy because in the rest of my life, I feel like I run around at a million out miles an hour. So I like that it kind of slows you down and yeah, you get to take in everything around you. I suppose people with quite busy lives, I often hear that as an answer that that actually uh, ultra running is a place where it's just you and the race. It's just you and the trail. It's, it's the absolute simplicity of it that seems to appeal. You say that's fair? Yeah, no, that that's, is one thing that I really like about it. No, fantastic. Well, it, that should give you a decent enough mindset to handle the monotony of, what, 870 odd miles of mainly A roads in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not the prettiest route, um, I must admit. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty boring at times, but fun as well. well uh, good. Um, we've we've all come across the concept of type two fun. I'm sure that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, when when did that spark happen? Then when did you decide right? I'm going to go for this. I'm going to go for this record. Or and did you decide to go for the record straight away, or was it about was it a just a project initially you wanted to do the route um yeah it was pretty much at the beginning of lockdown so lockdown had just happened um i could see that all my races were just getting cancelled like as each day went on um within about a week i had nothing left for the rest of the year and I just saw this like little gap i was like this is awesome i've actually where i'd had commitments to race that had just been removed and all of a sudden I've got a whole year where I can do what I want. And so I started to think, I don't know, like Le Jog just kind of jumped out at me. I was looking at some maps, trying to think of a route and it just, I just kept coming back to it and I was like, oh, Le Jog, like that, that would be awesome. Um, it would be, yeah, it scared me, which is what I liked about it as well. Like it was completely ridiculous. Um, but I had a good base level of endurance because I was actually just about to go and do two oceans and a month later do comrades. And the one race you did manage to fit in before lockdown, you'd won and got a course record as well. So you, you were in good form. Yeah. And I was feeling really good. So I was like, let me kind of use this to do something really yeah, cool. We're doing something. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, I just, I thought about the jog and well, actually I was going to do it the other way around until I got a bit of advice, joggle, um, from John O'Groats down to Land's End. And yeah, I think pretty much straight away, I was like, I'm going to go for the world record. Like, I don't know why I thought that I just decided that that yeah. was my option. <laughs> why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um before you go on, you've just brought something else up there that, that made me think. Why the jog rather than joggle? For the uninitiated, me not having run the length of the UK, well, why the jog rather than joggle? What's, what's the big difference? So um, when you're going for a world record, you can do it either way you want. And initially, I had started to plan it from going from John O'Groats down to the Land's End. But then I started to speak to a few people for some advice. And one person I spoke to is Dan Lawson, who's actually just finished the jog himself about three days ago. Yeah, out. I've, I was chatting to him about 20 minutes ago, trying to organize a podcast with him as well. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, he had tried it a couple of years ago. And he said to me, if you can go south to north, then do it. Because he had awful headwinds when he went the other way and the wind in the UK tends to be southeast to north tends to go up the country so I was like do you know what if someone's giving me that that advice that's done it before I think I'll take that and then also the last five days of the run or four days of the run um, are all along the A9 in Scotland which sounds really boring but I thought when the team and myself were getting really tired, it would be a lot less admin just to run on one straight road instead of having to navigate the lane. So I was like, if we're, I can make all of our lives a bit easier, then I will. So that makes good sense. Reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, anyway, I, I did kind of stop you in full flow there. We're, so at the start of lockdown, you kind of came up with this idea, suddenly freed from your racing calendar. 
Also, I think that's an amazing attitude. It would have been very, very easy, especially as as a runner, someone so tied to the sport, to have seen lockdown and watched that race calendar empty and and despair at it, rather than seeing that race calendar empty and thinking, okay, what madness am I going to get up to instead? So, I mean, fantastically well done on that. If it, 2020 has, hit, has been a demotivating year for a lot of people, but, but not ultra runners, apparently. No, apparently we all had the same idea to go and do something crazy. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all of you. It's, uh, it's been a busy year for podcasting as well. Um, so uh, how did you, it must have been difficult then to make a decision on when you were going to be doing it? Because, of course, you wouldn't know when lockdown restrictions were going to be lifted enough for you to do the attempt. So how do, how do you prepare for something this big, but that's so fluid? Yeah, so I basically, I was looking at the dates, and so this is back in April. My birthday was at the end of July, so I was like, I know what I'll do. I'm going to plan it to finish this on my birthday, because that would be a really nice birthday present to give yourself. Brilliant. Um, Yeah, Uh, turns out it's a very painful birthday present to give to yourself. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I just... I planned back from there, um, the 12 days. And then also, if you want to do a Guinness record, you have to submit an application to them 12 weeks before you want to start, basically asking permission to do it. And then they send you the guidelines, which you have to stick to. And it turns out that that was 12 weeks away. So I was like, yeah, it's meant to be. Um, oh, yeah, so, that's fake. Yeah, exactly. So I just put everything in and then yeah I got a little bit nervous the week before when I still hadn't had the acceptance letter from Guinness I was like please can this hurry up um and then I just hoped that all the lockdown restrictions would open up um the ones in England did two weeks before we started but the ones for Wales and Scotland opened up three days before we started so wow (laughs) It's a bit nerve wracking, but I was like, well, it's kind of meant to be. Everything kind of fell into place just in the nick of time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It did. Um, and what did training look like for you? I, d- I know I read, I think it was a Red Bull article that was done as well, which is fantastic. You're getting the notoriety you deserve from this. Um, uh, but it had mentioned that you'd had to sort of begin your training at least under lockdown in South Africa on a hundred meter stretch of driveway. Mm, yeah. So for the first five weeks of lockdown in South Africa, we were in a hard lockdown and you weren't allowed to leave your house. So oh, wow. um, I did manage to get a turbo trainer the day before lockdown. Like everyone was just like running around, like scavenging any piece of like equipment that they could. And then because I really wanted to run, all I could do was run up and down the driveway. So we had like six other houses that all share a driveway. So I had to go and ask them, do you mind if I run up and down it all day? And they're like, you're weird. Yeah, just carry on. (laughs) And yeah, literally up and down. It was very boring. But, you know, it kind of, it kept me sane at the same time. And after doing... I think the first like five or six runs, I was like, I know how I'm going to make this interesting. And I just put a message out to like friends and family and actually on Instagram saying, if anyone wants to run with me, then let me know. And then I just phoned people, had my phone in my pocket and we just like chatted rubbish as I ran up and down the driveway, which was like a cool way to make it less boring and to catch up with people. (laughs) Oh, well done. Hey, keeping yourself connected during lockdown through that as well. That's, that's multiple birds with one stone. Um, fantastic. So five weeks of running 100 meters at a time up and down your driveway. When when did you get to properly begin sort of training for this in earnest? Yeah, so then after that, um, it was pretty much at the end of that five weeks. I planned my training. I basically did a long week, a long run on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And I started with 15 kilometers on each day and just added 5K each week until I got to 50K. And I stopped there because 10 days later, we were starting the jog. So that was my, my taper. So, and then I did a couple of speed sessions a week and had a day off. So that was pretty much the structure. It was quite simple, but practicing that back-to-back running and long, long days. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Now, uh, one thing I think that people often neglect to think about before these is the amount of work that must go into planning the logistics as well. Yeah, <laughs> you look. Yeah, I saw that. There was a little flicker across your face then. Of, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cannot cannot be easy. Um, I, it, planning this as a trip just as a road trip would have been logistically difficult enough getting all your routes, but to do it on foot. How how big a team were you working with? So I did all the planning myself and yeah, you're like, cool, I'm a runner, but all I'm doing is staring at Excel spreadsheets. This is really fun um, because I was having to, in the spreadsheet, like work out my food plan, when I was going to eat, what I was going to eat, making menus for the team to be able to cook, making shopping lists for us to go and buy all the food beforehand, planning the route, plotting the route. Like that took about four days of literally clicking a centimeter on a time up a map the whole way up the UK, which was a bit soul destroying. But, wow. and then I it ended up like I ended up getting a little bit lazy and then I would just jump over roundabouts, which actually ended up backfiring in the actual run where at the end of the day, I was like, why have I run one kilometer more than I planned? <laughs> and freaking out at 1K when it was because I was being lazy. Um, <laughs> and yeah, then trying to find a support team to help me, um, the mobile homes that we were staying in, sponsors, um, kit. Yeah, it's just, it was a lot of planning and actually it was quite stressful in the last couple of weeks trying to get everything together. But I think however much time you give yourself, those last two weeks before you go are always stressful and you're always running around like a maniac trying to, trying to find everything. Um, but we did start having these little like team meetings once I got our team together and we would just have one of those like once every Friday afternoon. And yeah, it was more just a chat and occasionally someone would mention something that we needed to do. And yeah, it was, it was quite handy. <laughs> I, I think it's easy to, to not think about that from the outside point of view that, you know, in, in another sport, in, in athletics or something like that, if someone's at the world record breaking end of their sport, you would expect them to have a manager and a team of underlings who are out doing all this planning for them, but not so with this type of record. That's that's all your own homework that we're seeing the result of out there on the trail. Um, it's just a spectacular amount of work. It must almost be a relief when all you've got to do is put one foot in front of the other and the, and the event has finally started. Yeah, 100%. Like those first few steps on the first day all of a sudden you're like this is amazing like I no longer have to worry about a spreadsheet or what I'm going to eat or what I'm going to do because now that's batons handed over to the team and all I have to do is run so yeah that moment when you start you're like thank god <laughs> yeah I bet how much contact had you had with the uh, previous holders of the record? Because uh, we interviewed Sharon Gator just after she bagged this record and we've we've had Mimi Anderson on twice. Yeah, so I spoke, I emailed Sharon um, and she was really helpful um, giving me some advice about her um, experience of it. And Mimi and I had a Skype chat and then bounced some emails um, back and forth as well, which was super helpful and then I also spoke to Dan and to James Williams, who tried it last year as well. So, you know, one of Mimi's bits of advice was just go and speak to anyone you can that's done it. Um, because everyone kind of gave you like a different little nugget, um, which was which was really cool. And yeah, that's one thing that I really liked. And Sharon actually ended up coming out to see me on the run um, and say hello. And you know, I don't think there's many sports where, you know, if someone's trying to break your record, you would go along and run with them and help them. And that's what for me is like really special about ultra running that it is this awesome community where everyone backs everyone. And, you know, we all help each other out as much as we can, which I think is really cool. Absolutely. Some of the other FKT episodes I've recorded recently, there's been a Everybody has wanted to thank so many people after their record attempts because it, it takes a community to put these things together. Um, yeah, I, I just think that's a fantastic aspect of the ultra running scene. I really do. Um, so how were you feeling on that start line? Were, 
it's some days you get on a start line and everything has fallen together and you're feeling really optimistic and sometimes you're standing there and that the race just looks really big all of a sudden how how were you standing on that start line yeah i actually felt really good like my training had gone really well everything had come together um and I was actually feeling quite at ease. Like, I don't think I really realized that I was about to try and run to Scotland, like, because mentally I tried to just break it down and I was only thinking about every day. Um, so it wasn't very daunting because I don't think I'd thought of the bigger picture. Um, but yeah, like everything had gone well. And with things like these, with records and FKTs, you do just have to hope that everything comes together on the day. And luckily, at this point, everything had. Excellent. I, I mean, then you're, you're in the perfect mindset to start off on something this monstrous. Um, and what, what was your schedule look like before you started on this? Was it, was it very, very regimented and very tight? Or were you, did you have a, a system rather than a strict plan going into this? So I basically got the total distance and divided it by 12, pretty much, um, very technical. And I'd put in a 24 hour buffer on the end because from having done stuff like this before, I knew that stuff goes wrong. So it wasn't a case of it might, like we would need to use that at some point, but we had this big buffer on the end. And then, yeah, I'd set certain distances for each day. They kind of varied between 108 to 100. 15k depending on if there was a lay-by to stop at that was just my rough looking on on the map um the first three days we stopped at the right distance um but then after that i ended up getting a bit slow um so we changed the plan and basically said i was going to run from 5 a.m till 10 p.m each day and get as far as i could or if i'd hit the distance that i wanted to run then we would stop then but it turned out from then onwards, um, yeah, we did 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And I think it was good to have that fluidity in the plan. Like it didn't, it meant that no one freaked out because we were still within grasp. We still had a big buffer. Um, so it wasn't like we had to panic because after the third or fourth day, actually, no, I think it was actually about the sixth day where I fell like 5K short. And then it went to 10K and it was slowly creep, creeping up as, as you would expect, just because we were getting tired, but it was nothing to panic about. Um, and I think having either reaching a distance or doing it by time was a nice way to do it, to make sure in the beginning, if I'd done the first day just on time, I probably would have ended up running 150 kilometers and might have got injured further, uh, faster. So I think... For me, it worked quite well having an either or for each day. I get you. Uh, what, where were you sleeping each night? So we had two camper vans, um, a little one and then like a big motorhome. And the plan was to stay in that the whole way. Um, but then we ended up, I think it was on day three, we ended up stopping opposite uh, a hotel. So the guys like amazingly got me a hotel room for the night and then one um company um nbf alpine adventures who had sponsored some of the project then also gave some additional funding to be like get a hotel room for the rest of it because it's going to make your life a hell of a lot easier and it was so nice that we actually had that little pot which we could use for a hotel room but basically what i said is if we finished and we were within 15 minutes drive of somewhere, a hotel or a B and B, then we would go there. If we weren't, if it was too far, then we would just stay in the motorhome. So we ended up staying in a hotel, I think uh, about nine nights and three nights in the camper van. And, you know, just having a proper shower at the end of the day and being able to stand up to get changed and, you know, those tiny little things like, actually made a huge difference i bet you know how if you're doing a multi-day race how much difference does that one sachet of hot chocolate in your bag make at the end of the day having an actual hot shower in a bed 
Fantastic. But, and, you know, you've got to make the most of your opportunity at rest when you're only factoring in seven hours of downtime in a 24-hour period, which sounds insane when I do the numbers that way around. You were running for 17 hours a day. What are your calorie needs like during this? Like to run 17 hours a day, how much of that time are you having to spend fueling? Oh, so I needed, we worked out, I needed about seven and a half thousand calories a day. And basically what I did. That's so much I, cake. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up getting so much cake. People just brought us cake every day. It was awesome. But at one point we're like, okay, you need to stop bringing cake. We've, we've <laughs> actually got too much. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had like porridge for breakfast at about 30K. We would stop for brunch where I'd have a fried egg sandwich lunchtime at 60k i'd have like a toasted sandwich and then dinner at the end i'd have pasta um but then every 30 minutes throughout the day i was eating so i was eating anything from pancakes cakes sausages sausage rolls quiche biscuits fruit peanut butter sandwiches it was basically like a party buffet like all day um and yeah i just ate all day long i found actually on my garmin like the day before we started that it has this little alarm function so i set it just to beep at me every 30 minutes and it just came up saying eat and every 10 minutes it just said drink um and it was actually really good having to remove me having to think about that out of the process it just beeped and i just did what it told me to and Yeah, I think my eating plan worked really well. Like I didn't have any slumps in energy for the whole run and I only lost two kilos, which I don't think is that much for... I actually put on weight because of water retention during the run. Um, But once my body had settled down, yeah, it was only two and I was pretty pretty happy with that for how far we ran. I can't remember where I read it, but I remember somebody once referring to ultra running as just eating competitions, basically. And it, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a fantastic buffet. There's your trade off for all the hours of pain you were going through each day. Um, I, you know, I, I think when someone's done something that's absolutely epic, it's easy to get bogged down in, you know, how were the hard times and stuff. And we are going to get to that, Carla. But w- w- what were the highlights? You know, I know I mentioned earlier that it's it's just a series of A roads, right? But there there must be areas of the country where that were actually kind of a pleasure to run through. Yeah, there was one bit um, just outside. One, Bristol. one bit. No, <laughs> there was actually two nice bits. First one um, was called the Strawberry Line, um, which is where they used to cart strawberries back in the day, as I learned from Bristol to London um, to sell at the markets. And it was, yeah, it was like 10 K of this like gravelly trail and covered in trees. And yeah, it was just awesome. It was really nice to run through. I had some people join me on the run, which was awesome. And it was just nice being away from cars. And the second nice bit was also being away from cars was when I went up and over the Pennine Hills, um, just South of Edinburgh, um, I was on the trails. It was awesome to run on. There was no one else up there. There was no other cars. It was a glorious day for Scotland. It was one of the days it didn't rain, um, which was nice. Um, And yeah, it was just really fun to be off road. And because the ground was so much softer, I felt like I could actually run. I like felt, okay, I'm a runner again, where all the days before I felt like I was just a shuffler. Uh, it's a good long way into the attempt as well to to get that respite, you know, to get that chance to stretch your legs and not not bump into people. And the, yeah, the cars, the monotony of the sort of fumes from the cars as well must really start to get to you. Yeah, and the cars just, you're on like dual carriageways for most of it and they're just flying past you at 70 miles an hour. By the end, like they weren't even bothering me anymore. I was just used to it. But if someone came to join me, they're like, oh my God, the cars. And you're like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I'd just forgotten about them. But yeah, when you escape from them, it was very nice. <laughs> and what about people-wise? I've, I've never heard anyone go through an epic adventure of any sort without having bumped into a few delightful people along the way. So in terms of support, what were you finding? 
Yeah, it was awesome. Like you were running down the road. It was so funny. And people would literally just jump out of bushes. Like, I don't know where they came from, but... <laughs> I think that's an attack, Carla. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. so you're running down like the A30 in Cornwall and then there's someone just coming out the bush. You're like, all right, hi. <laughs> and yeah, it was awesome. Like we said from the beginning, anyone could join me. Um, and it was nice. I met like some of like old friends from like uni came and joined me. It's people I hadn't seen in 10 years. Um, complete strangers who I've never met before. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really cool that all these people had made the effort to come and join me. Um, I did feel a bit bad because in the afternoons of each day, well, like five o'clock onwards, I tended to have a really bad patch and just didn't physically have the energy to talk to anyone. Um, and I had some guys come and join me and they'd driven for ages and I was chatty in the beginning. And then eventually I was just giving them one word answers because I couldn't talk anymore. And I was in a world of pain. So we just said after that, please don't join me after 5 PM. Um, <laughs> come in the day when I'm a nice human. Um, <laughs> and Fair enough. yeah. And yeah, that tended to work a lot better. Um, and, but you know, that's part of this. You kind of learn how you're feeling and how your body is and your mind is throughout each day. I just wish I'd known, like I knew I was going to be running slowly, but I didn't realize how slowly I was going to run. And I think if I'd known, I would have said to people like, really anyone can come and join me because some people were like, oh no, I'll slow you down. And I'm like, no, 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 really you won't. <laughs> because <laughs> you could power walk next to me some people could that's like how slowly I was running um so yeah I wish I had known that before but it was you know the speeds you are going are really inclusive for anyone that wants to join you which is cool well I'll bear that in mind next time absolutely I, I might even have been able to keep up with you there um so you were saying the each evening then you were hitting a point where physically you weren't really able to engage with people. Um, were you, was that getting worse as the event, as the race went on? I assume race, you know what I mean? Uh, as the attempt went on? No, it just kind of, it lasted for about three hours each day and it would just come out of nowhere. And it was like hitting the wall in a marathon, but on steroids. Hmm. It was horrible. You all of a sudden, you just, you don't know when it's going to come. It was roughly the same time each day around five, six o'clock. And I just didn't have like the inclination or energy to want to engage with anyone. It was just, I just had to get my head down and just run and it would last two or three hours and then you'd be fine again. It was like so weird. You're like running, like this is disgusting. Like just leave me alone. Like it was quite nice having people just chat behind me. So like if one of the crew came and ran, they would chat to like the cyclist and that was a quite nice distraction. But you know, they'd be like to me, do your legs hurt? I'm like, yeah. Are you tired? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was just like, Oh my God. Like, so I was like, just started to ignore people. Um, but, you know, everyone, the crew kind of got the gist of when that was happening. I did feel a bit bad because I had two cyclists with me. One did the morning shift and one did the afternoon shift. And poor Dave in the afternoon got miserable Carla every day. And Scouse got like, oh, I'm having loads of fun, Carla. <laughs> oh, wait, where do you go when, when you're in that kind of mental space? Because I don't think anyone can get through this kind of endurance event, even if it's something much smaller than this, without encountering a not particularly chipper version of yourself somewhere along the way. But it, if you've got a three-hour dark patch that you're going through, where where does your brain go to to cope with that? It literally just goes to just getting your head down and moving forward and just thinking, you know, waiting for my watch to beep and eating and drinking. You almost don't really think of anything else. All I was saying to myself, you know, just keep moving forward. And as long as I was going forward, I was happy. Um, so yeah, you almost just get rid of everything in your head and just, just go forward and just try and make it yeah, as simple as possible, really. I mean, it, it, it sounds like there's a lot of monotony involved there and that you're in quite a dark place at the time, but then it almost sounds meditative as well. That there is, there is nothing in that time and space except you and moving and eating. 
Yeah, it, that's exactly what it's like. And I think because you've been, you're running for 17 hours a day, actually that three hour period goes a lot quicker than it would normally. Like time just kind of passes by a lot easier. Like it didn't feel like, oh my God, I'm running for 17 hours a day. Like none of the days actually felt like that, which was a bit weird. <laughs> wow. But yeah, it does. Your, your perception of time must change over the course of something like this. Um, okay. And physically, how were you doing? Like, did you encounter any injuries along the way? Were there were there things that, that held you back physically? So after lunchtime on day one, every single step until I finished hurt, it was just, <laughs> I'd... I knew I knew I had to go off slowly on day one and I thought I was going off slowly, but it turns out I wasn't in the grand scheme of things. And I also didn't realize how hilly Cornwall is. And I know for people that live in Cornwall, they think that's ridiculous, but I didn't really think that Cornwall and Devon would be so hilly. And they were they're actually, not big lumps, but there's so many of them, right? It's just relentless. They yeah. just you're either going up a hill or down a hill. There was no flat. So for two days I just smashed my legs up. But I guess the first eight days, um, it was just, my legs were just sore from that Dom's feeling that you get after a big race. It was like someone had come and smashed me with a bat. Um, it was very sore. It hurt a lot. Um, the soles of my feet were really sore just from being on my feet and pounding into the ground all day. But it wasn't until about day nine that I started to get like the start of an injury so I started to get in my left leg um, a bit of a pain in the tendon and then I actually ended up getting a skin infection cellulitis in my left chin oh, um, timing. yeah but it was just lucky that our doctor who was just meant to be remote decided that he would come and join us he took a picture of my shin and sent it to like his doctor friends and one of them was the ultra running doctor. And she was like, right, I've seen this three times before. I think it's cellulitis, get her on antibiotics. <laughs> and I think it was just lucky that she had seen it, kind of knew what was happening. I, I wasn't very keen on having to take medicine um, no. just because I knew my body was under a lot of stress. But he was like, no, nah, the only way to get rid of this is to, to take um, antibiotics. But then because we initially thought it was like a tendon issue. We had struck my foot and then I ended up the next day, like my hamstrings were in a world of pain. And then the next day went into my quad, but I still managed to run all of those days up until lunchtime on day 12 where, yeah, my quad ended up being so sore that I physically couldn't run and had to walk, which was just irritating. <laughs> oh, I mean, you, it's obviously not, it's stupid to call it the home stretch because you're still a long way away at the point where that's happened. But, uh, you know, compared to what you've just done, it's got to look like you can almost see the finish line and then you can't run anymore. That must have been mentally very difficult to swallow at the time. Yeah, it was kind of good and bad. I guess there was 80 kilometers to go. Um, I couldn't run. Um, everyone that came alongside me, they're like, have you tried to run? I'm like, yes. I keep trying. <laughs> I still can't no, run. No, I haven't thought of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just walking down the road because I can't be bothered anymore. No. Um, so, yeah, um, it was like, okay, this could have happened in the middle and things would have been a whole lot worse. And it's happened actually on the last day. I've got 80K to go. Um, but then, you know, it was the last day was just horrendous. So, I'm having to walk and then all of a sudden like this northerly storm decides it wants to come in. So we're walking and then we get rain and then we get 30 mile an hour winds with 60 and 90 mile an hour gusts, which was just like it was pushing me back to Land's End. I'm like, really? <laughs> Are we going <laughs> to no. do this? Yeah. Um, so originally I was scheduled to finish at about 10 o'clock um, on the 27th of July and now I'm reduced to a walk. And I've got, at this point, I probably had, I don't know, 50K to go. And I was like, right, guys, I'm not going to bed. Um, we're just going to crack on through the night. <laughs> and 
I'm just going to get this finished. So yeah, much to everyone's delight. I was like, I just can't go to bed. Like, you know, we're so close. I'm just going to push through. It's the last night. Um, so yeah, in the wind and rain uh, and the dark, we just carried on going um, until we got to the end. Hey, what a dramatic finish though. Yeah, but like in your head, you're like, yeah, I'm going to run to the finish line. I'm going to touch that pole. It's going to be awesome. And then you're like, I had to have this silver like blanket on me because I was so cold and like shivering and <laughs> you're running oh. in, you're walking in, you touch the pole. Like, I'm like, should we get pictures? And everyone's like, everyone's so cold. Everyone's exhausted from being up for 24 hours. We're like, yay, that was awesome. Okay, go to bed. See you all later. <laughs> 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 and everyone just like ran away from the wind as quickly as possible. But I am so glad that I didn't have to wake up to like that horrific weather that we just pushed through it and it was done. Oh uh, yeah, I bet. I, it's always harder to get going against when you've stopped, isn't it? And yeah, that, that would have made for a very, very tough morning for you, I'm sure. Um, what was that finish line like? Because like, I, it's, Ultra running in so many ways is such an understated sport where for the amount of effort and preparation and pain that you've gone through to get to that finish line, really there should be a Ferrari there as a prize and a fireworks display and a hundred thousand people. But but it's never the case. It's usually like a lukewarm coffee out of a thermos and then falling asleep in the back of someone's car. What 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 did it look like for you? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it was really nice. My mum and dad had come all the way up. Um, oh, that's good at least. London, yeah. And my mum just says to me, well, at least it wasn't a waste of time, me coming up here. You know? <laughs> Cheers, mum. <laughs> <laughs> Only mothers can like say that. Can't? You're just like, yeah, yeah okay. Um, so, yeah, there was, you know, we had the crew there, a couple of friends, my mum and dad, um, my brother and sister. That was really cool. But yeah, the weather was just horrific that everyone stood around. I think a bottle of champagne got like sprayed in someone's face, which made them like really angry because it was 5 a.m. and they hadn't <laughs> slept. And I was like, oh, God. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, we literally, yeah, very awkward. Went to bed, yeah, to a lukewarm cup of tea, jumped in the shower. Actually, it was really funny. The... BBC had phoned and that we'd finished at 5.30 and they're like, can you come on live at 6am? I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do I'm you know really what sorry. I've just done? I'm like, we were drenched to the bone, like soaking wet. Like all I wanted to do was like get in the shower. I was like, yeah, I, I, I can't. <laughs> so having to have like your clothes peeled off you because you've got no energy to like take anything off. You're just trying to get warm. And yeah, it's, in a way, it was kind of like an anti-climax. You know, you finish and you're like, okay, cool, that's done. See you guys for breakfast in a few hours. Because <laughs> I don't think there is anything that could happen at the end of something that big that, that wouldn't feel like a bit of an anti-climax. Um, but once you'd had time to process and, you know, eat and warm up and sleep and everything else, when, when did it really hit you? How, and, and how did you feel about it? You've, you must be really pleased. Yeah, I think it was, it definitely didn't hit for like, a, even for a few days. You're like, oh, this is really weird. It started to sink in a little bit on the drive home when it took like two days to drive back from Scotland. And you're like, oh, it's actually really far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and even now, I don't know, I find it a bit weird still to think, oh, I, I ran up the whole country. Like it still hasn't quite sunk in properly, but when I look at a map and I can see my route, like that's really cool. You're like, oh my God, like I did all of that on my own two feet. Um, and that's, yeah, that's quite awesome. Yeah, well, I'm, you should have a tremendous sense of pride about this. It's absolutely staggering what you did there. And I look forward to you receiving a Guinness Book of Records for Christmas and finding your name in it. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> wouldn't it just? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, you had an opportunity before this to chat to Sharon and Mimi and Dan and, and sort of get the lowdown on what their attempts were like. When you get a phone call from someone saying they're going to go and have a go at your record, what, what's your advice to them going to be? Well, I've actually already had a surprising amount of people get in touch saying that they're giving it a go, which wow. yeah, is crazy. Um, I don't think I appreciated how much of a big thing 
like Le Jog is and how many people actually do it. And yeah, it's really cool having people like get in touch wanting to give it a bash. But I think, I don't know, the biggest bit of advice is that you just can't underestimate like how hard it is. And you just need to accept that it's going to hurt. If you're going for a record, it's going to be painful. Um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be emotional. But once you've done, once you've finished, it is awesome. Like that feeling of accomplishment once you've done it is really cool. You just have to almost, I think the quicker you can accept that you are just going to be in a pain cave, that you're going to cry every day, um, that it's going to be emotional, the better. Like I've had a couple of guys, I'm like, right, you're going to cry. They're like, no, I'm not going to cry. My friends can't see me cry. I'm like, you're going to cry. Um, <laughs> and you can't you do anything about it. <laughs> but it's almost your body just having this like release. Um, but yeah, I think, I think people should go for it. It's a cool thing to do. Um, it is epic, but you know, if you're willing to put in the hard work, um, I can't see why anyone can't, can't do it. Um, it is just hard work and yeah, embracing the pain. <laughs> well, that's sounds like sound advice. I, I won't be taking you up on it just at this point. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just seen what it did to Dan Lawson. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't fancy putting myself through that straight away, but. I know, as he was running, I was like, Dan, slow down. <laughs> You're making me feel like I didn't try hard enough. <laughs> no. No, he, I was like, he... should I do it again? I'm like, no, Carla, remember. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you've still got the record for now. Just, just <laughs> settle. It's okay. You've got God, this. No. <laughs> um, are there any big plans now? Have you, are you looking ahead at another record? Is this is this maybe changed things? Are you are you gonna fill your race calendar in twenty twenty one? Are you or are you thinking about this kind of challenge now? I want to try and get a balance between the two. Like I do love racing and like pushing myself really hard and racing against other people, but I also love like this adventure kind of running. So for me, it's finding that almost like sweet spot where I can where I can do both. Um, and picking like the cool races, but also planning some adventures. Um, I really want to do the GR10, which is a run over the Pyrenees from the Atlantic to the Med. Oh, wow. Um, mainly to have a holiday in Nice at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I've also started to do a couple of the islands around Great Britain. So I've done the Isle of Wight and Jersey. And I think this will be like a 10 year kind of project, just see how many I can tick off. And then in the last week or so, this is dangerous. I've kind of got it into my head like, oh, wouldn't it be really cool to run around the edge of the whole of the UK? Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and normally when I get something like that in my head, it's quite difficult to get out and I normally do it. So <laughs> but I do think it would be cool. I probably wouldn't do it as a record. I'd probably do it as something a bit a bit more fun and enjoyable like carrying all my own kit and doing cool things along the way awesome hey you'll have to chat to my well sometime co-host chris did a coast hunting thing a couple of years back it was a mixture of cycling and running but he's done the whole coastline too so oh, awesome yeah. yeah little bit further than what you've just done but it sounds like fun. yeah i know i look i was like oh my god it's like over five thousand miles oh it's really wow far. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a wobbly coastline, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, look, thanks once again for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to chatting to you again after whatever next ridiculous thing it is that you've done. <laughs> Pleasure. And thanks for having me on. Awesome. No worries. And seriously, once more, congratulations. It's an absolutely amazing record. Thank you. No worries. You enjoy the rest of your day.